Little John Davis, as I speak tonight, W4QDX, a member of the Gars Club, uh, did a little quick research. The Dayton Hamvention, which is the the be-all, end-all of Hamvention's Ham Radio Conventions, uh, names a Ham Radio Club of the Year. In 2010, North Fulton uh, was the Ham Radio Club of the Year. 2011, Albemarle somewhere. Then they had West Palm Beach. And then they had uh, Orlando this year. 2014, Gars. Um, so we're in pretty elite company. If you think of all the ham radio clubs across the entire United States, two of them, Metro Atlanta, have been the club of the year. John is a member of Gars because he lives on that side of the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> Only because he lives on that side of the freeway. Otherwise, he'd be a member of the North Fulton Group. John is a recognized expert on all things digital when it comes to VHF and UHF transmission, namely D-Star, which is the ICOM flavor of digital voice over radio, and Fusion, which is the Yesu version of digital voice over radio. And he can correct all the stuff I'm saying that's wrong when he gets up here. <laughs> so far, Kenwood has not entered the fray, and maybe he'll correct me on that. But we're going to learn all about what is D-Star, what is Fusion. This is sort of a primer for those of us who don't know or know just enough to be dangerous like me. And so I hope you will join me in welcoming John Davis, WB4QDX, to talk to us about digital technologies in amateur radio. I brought toys, so I'll be getting those out from time to time. Um, someone told me this was a, a really good turnout, and I felt really good uh, thinking, oh, oh, maybe they came to, to hear my presentation. But then I remembered, Norm reminded me he was bringing ice cream, so <laughs> I thought, no need there. Um, I'm going to focus on two of the digital technologies uh, that are out there. There are a couple of more for voice, um, but these two seem to be the, uh, that's probably a good idea, you don't have to see the speaker that way. <laughs> um, these two seem to be, <laughs> surprise the uh, fact, these two seem to be the most uh, active um, and it is an ever-changing environment. And I, I try to dabble in all of them. Um, I have my favorites. But uh, I also try to uh, get as much information as I can about different digital technologies. If you really kind of look at some of the background, amateur radio is kind of coming late to the game. Um, the, uh, the commercial two-way world uh, was mandated by the FCC to go narrowband. And one of the ways to go narrowband is to go digital. So phase one was not necessarily digital. Um, some were, and then phase two, most of the commercial and especially governmental public safety systems have gone narrowband digital. And that started happening about the mid-1990s. Along with that, your cellular telephone uh, went digital back in the 90s. Uh, the amateur radio modes have, uh, even though there's been some, uh, the, we say the original digital is CW, uh, and it's been around for quite a while. Uh, it's either on or off, so there's your ones and zeros. Uh, and then, you know, we've had packet, but really getting into pure digital transmissions and digital voice, uh, that's been a little bit later happening. I want to go over just a few things about digital voice in general, and uh, then we'll get into the specifics of uh, these two that we'll talk about tonight. Digital voice can occupy either more or less spectrum than an FM, signal or a, a single sideband signal uh, on HF, but they are generally by design more spectrally efficient. The bandwidth depends on the data rate and the modulation type. Uh, if you have a higher data rate, the voice quality goes up, uh, as evidenced by uh, if you look at CD quality, uh, it's going to be quite a bit better than your, your uh, digital voice over ham radio and then the different modulation types. Some are more efficient than others. 
Now here's the thing, with a digital voice transmission, they're generally static free until you get to a very weak signal condition. And then they start dropping off, you'll get some garbling. Uh, some people refer to this as R2-D2, because uh, it does sound like the little guy. And then it mutes out. But generally you won't get the static. It's either there, pretty much, or not there. Here's kind of a depiction of that. If you look at the green line, as we all know, as the signal strength starts going down, you start getting more noise, more static, more white noise uh, interjected into the signal until you get down to a very weak signal, and it's pretty much unreadable. Now take a digital signal, digital voice signal, uh, for several reasons, one of them being error correction applied with it, that it holds pretty much the same quality, same voice quality, until you get out into a very, see is this a pointer? Ah, yes. Until you get out to a very low signal strength area and it drops off pretty quick. It's kind of the edge of the cliff. So what you don't hear is the static as the signal gets weaker, but then it goes away. And we've kind of been conditioned to think about uh, well, I wonder why it went away. Well, you were pretty doggone weak at that point. That's generally the case. When you look at what's happening over the air, you've got the analog voice, kind of represented, kind of an amplitude modulation type audio. It's converted, it's sampled, and converted into ones and zeros, and then it modulates the carrier over the air. Now, that's a very simplified view. The different modulation schemes will look a lot different but it's a data carrier over the air. If you have your uh, FM radio on two meters, 70 centimeters, and you hear a digital repeater, it's going to sound like a hiss or a buzz. And sometimes you'll just think it's noise, but that may be a digital repeater. Uh, it has to uh, be a radio that's capable of decoding that before you, it's reconstructed back to voice. Now, I talked about bandwidth. If you look at a typical FM signal going through a repeater, it's about 16 kilohertz wide. That's how much spectrum it takes up. Now, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. I thought I was deviating 5 kilohertz. Well, that's plus or minus 5, plus you add in the audio component to that, and it ends up being about 16 kilohertz wide. That's how much spectrum you occupy. Now, most of the new digital schemes out there are quite a bit more efficient, and you're going to see them occupying about six and a quarter to about 7.6 kilohertz. Now, you're saying, oh, well, that's pretty good. Can't we fit in more repeaters? Well, we still have this problem of the pairs are channelized. And unless we kind of refarm the spectrum, and I don't see that happening anytime soon, you, can look, you don't really get the benefits of being able to add more repeaters, but what you do get is the ability to put repeaters closer together because it's narrow spectrum. All right, I'm first going to talk about D-Star, and then I'm going to talk about Fusion, and then I've got a, a closing slide that'll kind of compare them. If you do have any questions along the way, uh, maybe if you can, kind of hold them a little bit till toward the end and I'll try to catch up as, as time permits. If you look at where D-Star started, I went back and I had to refer to several documents to, to get back to this. D-Star really had its roots about 2001. Gosh, that's a while back when you really think about it. And the Japan Amateur Radio League, which as I understand it is kind of a combination of the FCC and the AWRL in Japan, <coughs> published the D-Star protocol. Uh, a couple of companies participated in that of your major Japanese manufacturers, ICOM and Kenwood. Uh, ICOM was the first of those uh, major Japanese radio manufacturers to adopt it. However, it is an open protocol. It is not owned by ICOM. It is not proprietary to ICOM. And so ICOM actually, the first radio that was produced was actually a 1.2 gigahertz radio not very useful for most of the things we do today, but that's kind of where Japan thought things <coughs> might be very useful. Uh, a couple of years later, they, they took 
Uh, well, they actually converted one of their existing radios, the 2200, to be able to drop a board in it to do D-Star. But the first one that was produced specifically for that was in 2005 with the ICOM 800, which was later uh, upgraded to the 880. In 2006, you had the repeaters introduced and the first uh, handheld. Now, all of these radios that are produced by ICOM for D-Star are both FM and D-Star cable. So you're not buying just a D-Star radio. Now here's where things started getting interesting. If you get up to about 2007, remember this is an open published protocol. You started getting some third party products uh, that are being made for it. And one of, the, one of the first ones and one of the most prominent ones was developed right here in the Atlanta area by uh, Robin Cutshaw, AA4RC, uh, his company Internet Labs. And you had the DV dongle, which was kind of the first uh, accessory uh, for D-Star. Now you started getting more and more products that were available for it, and I'll go through those in a lot more detail a little later. And I want you to remember that that is one of the things that has really helped D-Star grow because of all these third-party products that uh, either bring new features, new software, new devices, all of those things have really allowed more people to get into this uh, digital mode. So you, you get up to now, and I actually have a chart, I didn't include it here, uh, but I've kind of graphed the growth based on users, repeaters, and gateways, which are uh, essentially like a, a repeater cluster. Uh, and D-Star has remained the largest group of users, digital users, and also digital repeaters worldwide. So by having its roots back in the early 2000s, it's been able to grow quite a bit. As I mentioned, and this is one of the, the myths that uh, uh, is often misunderstood, it is an open published standard that was produced by the JARL specifically for amateur radio. There are a couple of commercial radio standards, ZMR, Moto Turbo, and P25, which have their roots in commercial and public safety uh, systems that have been brought down into amateur radio. But D-Star is one of the two that were produced specifically for amateur radio. And there are features within that that uh, uh, enhance that. One is that your call sign is actually transmitted every time you key the mic. I always have to throw this in. If you are an anonymous Kerchunker, D-Star is not for you. <laughs> Nor is Yezu System Fusion because your call sign displays on the other guy's radio every time you transmit. Caller ID. Caller ID for ham radio. Some people learn that lesson slowly. <laughs> the D-Star standard was first adopted by ICOM. Now I say first adopted, I, I've got to give my hats off to them. Uh, how many of you remember, and this is probably the late 80s, maybe early 90s, Alenco produced a digital HT. Did anyone have one of those? I only know one person that bought two. Um, and <laughs> he's not here. Uh, you had to buy two because here was the catch. It was a proprietary digital standard and nobody else produced anything for it. And you could only buy these two handhelds. So by the non-showing of hands, you really see that was a big handicap for them. By adopting an open standard and then a manufacturer producing a full product line of handhelds, mobiles, and repeater infrastructure, that has really helped it grow. And then the third party products and software uh, using that open standard has really added a lot of new features and capabilities. In fact, the basic function of linking repeaters together is not part of the ICOM standard or it's not a feature 
that ICOM developed. It's actually part of a third party um, capability that has some software that runs on the repeater and then also your radios are then capable of doing that. So a lot of new features. You do have in D-Star you have voice and data on the same carrier. So riding along with your voice is actually data and I'm talking about like serial data. Kind of like packet like data but serial data. And you do have the flexible networking of the repeaters. Now some will say, and this is going to apply to any of the digital standards that uses internet for linking, they'll say, oh, well, without the internet, this thing is useless. Wrong. Think about this. All of the features that you have, this applies to D-Star, and as Yezu System Fusion develops, it will apply to it. You can go simplex between radios, and I can do all the voice and data features. Add a repeater. I can increase my range just like I do on FM. If I add the internet as a component for linking, then I extend the range by linking to other repeaters, other areas, things called reflectors, which are like big conference bridges where multiple repeaters can connect together. Now here's an important uh, feature and function that you have with DSTAR. I think you'll also have with Fusion, but you do not have with DMR, Moto Turbo, and P25. Where you send your signal when you link, where I want my signal to go, do I want it to link to a repeater in Los Angeles or Australia, or do I want to link to a, to a reflector with 50 repeaters on it? That's under my control with my radio. It's not up to the system administrator. I can initiate that function from my radio. So that's one of those features in being specifically designed for amateur radio that uh, really makes it useful. You do have a higher speed data capability on 1.2 gigahertz. Remember I said that ID1 radio, the first one that was produced? Not only will it do regular D-Star and FM on 1.2, but you have a higher speed data mode, 128 kilobits, which can be used uh, a lot of different functions. It actually has an ethernet port on the radio. So it can function as like a last mile link, uh, an ethernet bridge, wireless between two points. Um, it can function uh, through a repeater to send data. Uh, we've sent, we've actually put one of those ID1 1.2 gig radios on an airplane and took some pictures and sent them back through the repeater and posted on Picasa, one of the, the photo sites on the internet. And so from the air, we were able to near real time take pictures, send them back and view them. It was actually that capability that enabled us to secure a $250,000 grant through GEMA to build out more repeaters in Georgia on D-Star. And again, as I said before, it does have the largest digital user base and largest number of repeaters worldwide. Now, what is a D-Star signal actually comprised of? If you break it down, it's 4,800 BPS over the air. So you're actually transmitting 4,800 bits per second over and over and over and over in a continuous stream. 2,400 of those bits are pure voice. Another 1,200 is what's called forward error correction. And that's kind of like for those of you in computers, uh, in the early days of computers, you had parity that would uh, come into play and that would help reconstruct if you dropped a bit. Well, forward air correction is like parity on steroids and allows the signal to be reconstructed even when you're missing quite a few of the bits. Now that leaves another 1,200 for pure data. Um, it does not have air correction on it, but you've got some programs that use that, that the air correction will be used, will be included in those programs. As I said before, you have voice and data it's occupying one RF carrier that's six and a quarter kilohertz wide. 
and that will allow for more repeaters in an area. One of the hats I wear is uh, I'm vice director for Georgia for the Southeast Repeater Association. And we've, uh, we have been able to fit repeaters closer together, especially when they're on adjacent frequencies. Because that narrower signal allows you to do that. Many of the, uh, the D-Star radios include an internal GPS or have the ability to connect a GPS to it. Now you can do several things with it. Okay, I can send that over the, that position data over the data channel and I can map my position, kind of like APRS, except you call it DPRS for digital uh, in, in D-Star. With the newest models of ICOM radios, handheld and mobile, you have memories within your radio that are geocoded. You know what I mean by that? Not only do you have the repeater frequency offset tone, tone is not part of digital, but you also have the Latin long position of that repeater. Okay, think about it. The radio knows where it is, it has GPS in it. The database, the, the memories that I have in my radio know where repeaters are. I can click nearest repeater and I can get a list of repeaters that are closest to me. Also, most of the newer models in the ICOM family of radios have an SD card. So your memory is not, your active memory in your radio is not stored there, but you can actually store multiple memory configurations. One of the things I do when I travel if, uh, in fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm probably going to St. Louis for a business trip. I'm going to go to a website that has a list of repeaters. I'm going to say, center on St. Louis. This is the radio I have, so it knows how many memories I have. And it's going to give me, it's going to fill my memories, 750 in my handheld, with all of the repeaters around there. Now, not only D-Star repeaters, but FM repeaters. So, when I go there, I go to my radio and say, import the St. Louis file, and suddenly I have a new memory configuration, and I can do nearest repeater there as well. So, a very nice feature within that. Every D-Star radio has a serial port. It's a simple serial report. Serial port. Transmit data, receive data, and ground. 1200 BPS. But there's a lot you can do with that. If I want to interface uh, my laptop to it, I don't have to do have a TNC in the middle, just one cable. So that makes it very simple. I mentioned devices, and I've got a bunch of them, but I've got the pictures up here of most of those. Here's one of the things that, that sets D-Star apart. Having been around for a while and being an open standard, a lot of people are developing stuff for it. One of the first ones that was developed was <coughs> the DV dongle. The little box, little blue box, smaller than, a little bigger than a matchbox, connects to your laptop or computer with a USB for power <coughs> and data, and I can use the sound card in my computer to get on D-Star repeaters, uh, my laptop's connected to the internet, uh, I can talk on repeaters, reflectors, and that gives me an easy way I can get on without a radio. Uh, internet Labs, who produce the DV dongle, come out with their second version called the DV3K, which is down the size of a flash drive now. Uh, does the same thing. Well, people took it one step further. They put in a little RF chip, a little RF transceiver chip in it, and created what's called a DV access point. Very simply, uh, I can connect this to my computer. It's on the internet. It's a 10 milliwatt transmitter and transceiver, and I can roam around with my handheld 
for about 100 meters or so and connect it to an outside antenna, get a little more range, and I've created my own little hot spot. Used to like to do that when I'd travel because I'd be in the hotel room and I didn't want to sit at my laptop if I wanted to talk on the radio, so I would do that and I could go down to the pool and sit around and still have my handheld with me and, and, and work it like that. Raspberry Pis came on the scene as a little computer, so I didn't have to connect that to my laptop. I could connect it to a Raspberry Pi. Someone came out about a year ago with what's called the DV Mega Board. It's a little daughter board that sits on top of your Raspberry Pi and does the same thing as this without having to connect to a computer. And I've got a couple of versions of that. So here's the one, here's version one of the one I built. It will actually fit in a little case. I had to drill a little hole where the SMA connector, antenna connector is. And so that is my complete little hotspot. I've got a uh, Wi-Fi mini dongle plugged in. Uh, it doesn't have a disk drive. It uses the SD card for the Linux operating system and any software. So that's plugged in. All I have to do is add power and an internet connection. And I've got my own little hotspot to carry around with me. Some people got fancy. A company up in Tennessee called Hardened Power Systems packaged all this in a very rugged enclosure and put some other little bells and whistles on it. So it was a little bigger, but it was a very ruggedized unit. They just came out and was showing at the Huntsville Ham Fest, and of course they had to get one of these. The version of this that's got the DV access point, the Raspberry Pi is underneath it, and it's even got a little power meter on it, and it's got four lithium ion cells to power it. Those, I think each one of those is like a 4,000 milliamp hour battery. So that thing will last a long time, and it's a nice little package in a hinged clamshell that you just fold up and it's all self-contained. I'll have it if you want to see it later. There's also been um, what's called GMSK modems. The, because you are modulating as a GMSK type modulation, uh, a modem to convert analog or to modulate your radio with the data uh, from vocoders, um, you can use a regular FM radio that's got a 9600 baud packet port and make it into a D-Star radio. It's kind of clunky, kind of kludgy, but we're hams, so we do that stuff. Uh, I've run my uh, Yezu FT8800, my 857, converted them into D-Star radios for both VHF, HF, and VHF, UHF, and HF. So there are some other things you can do point in this is there's a lot of stuff out there and by being an early guy on the block uh, there's a lot of stuff being developed and again because it is an open standard. Also there are several software applications. Uh, ICOM actually came out with this for their uh, newest model of radios, an Android app. Some will ask right off the bat, do you have that for an iPhone? And the answer is no. And the reason is, as you all know, Apple controls that interface very tightly, and they want a piece of the action. So these developers are small people. They're not going to pay $100,000 to just get their foot in the door with Apple and pay for their new spaceship headquarters out there. And so right now, the only thing available is in an Android app. Now, there is another one that is called DV Pro that, again, someone in the Atlanta area put this together. It's a Windows-based app. Uh, you just connect it to any, radio, any of the late model radios. And it has some really neat functions that it'll display all the call signs. You can use your radio and be net control. Never pick up a pen or pencil to write with. And I, I do a net... Um, several times a year called the Southeast D-Star Weather Net. We have about 50 repeaters from Texas through the Carolinas connected together 
and we have, I don't know, anywhere from 60 to 100 people checking in, and I can, do, I can run through those in, an, in less than an hour, and also I never pick up anything to write with. It will underline them as they key, and then I clear off the underlines when I acknowledge those people checking in. Neat little app. Then there's DRATS. Who comes up with a name called DRATS? Well, programmers are creative people. RATS is star backwards. Great. <laughs> DRATS is a tremendous program, though, I will tell you. Number one, it's free. We all like that. It's a very full-featured program and has a lot of, it was originally written for emergency communications applications, but it has a lot of capabilities. Within, I call it the Swiss Army knife of uh, data programs because you can do uh, messaging, you can send and receive forms, file transfer, chat, position reporting, all those things within there. We've been doing some DRATS classes uh, around the northern part of the state so uh, if there's another one handy, you might want to get in on that, especially the Aries folks. Uh, it, well, it, it, yes, it is. Uh, it's written in Python, <laughs> but uh, the source code is available for it. Uh, we are, I want to say fortunate, but we're not. A lot of hard work went into uh, building a lot of DSTAR repeaters around the state. Um, you can see from the coverage, and I'm only showing kind of the northern two-thirds of the state, um, quite a bit of coverage around. It doesn't cover everything, but we're covering a lot of the area. And you can see the list of stations. The uh, yellow circles are new ones that are, have either just come on the air in the last few months or coming on the air. Um, for example, this one over in the Cleveland, White County area just came on a few months ago. Uh, this one up around Blue Ridge and Morganton just came on a few weeks ago. Rome just came on a few weeks ago. Paulding County has been on about three months. This big blob here is going to be one, we're moving one that was actually up in the northern part of the state here, but that coverage has been duplicated, so we're moving it down to Mount Oglethorpe. So it's going to be at a 3,000 foot elevation here soon and uh, create more coverage. I think the actual coverage will be a whole lot more than that. And on the southwest side of town, the uh, Fayette County guys are putting one in probably in the next 60 days. And other parts of the state, um, we have coverage in the southern part of the state as well. So Georgia has a pretty good selection of D-Star repeaters. And if you want information on where they are, there's a good site for that www.dstarinfo.com dstarinfo.com no spaces no hyphens all right let's switch gears of the uh, the big guys and I'll, I'll say that as icom yezu and kenwood um, yezu had been conspicuously absent from that until late 2011 i think it was december of 2011 they produced a, or released a white paper on their digital plans. Now, what you've got to keep in mind at that point, Yesu had been purchased by Motorola. So um, that influenced a lot of what was in that white paper. So they announced that they were going to jump into the digital arena. It wasn't going to be compatible with anything else. Well, they didn't quite say that. They said it won't be compatible with DSTAR. Something about Japanese manufacturers falling on their sword rather than doing what the other guy's doing. They said they were going to use C4FM modulation, another form of digital modulation other than GMSK. It was going to be two slot TDMA. That sounded an awful lot like P25 or DMR, Moto Turbo, the Motorola implementation of that. So a lot of people really thought it was going to be compatible with one of those standards. Then Motorola spun back off Yezu. Yezu was kind of left with a kind of skeleton organization, unfortunately. So they had to regroup. That set back their digital plans a little bit. In early, um, at Dayton, 
in 2012, they actually showed under a nice little acrylic stand uh, what they, a mock-up of their uh, handheld radio, the FT-1D, you see here. Uh, it took another year before radio started getting introduced. However, now uh, they packaged it, called it System Fusion. It is a digital C4FM modulation, and it is FDMA, which means it is frequency division for each channel. It's not uh, TDMA time slots like you have in some of the commercial stuff. A couple of very neat things about Fusion. Um, just like T-Star, all the radios can operate regular analog FM or System Fusion Digital. And they offer, uh, like ICOM did, they offer a line of handhelds, mobiles, and a little later on, introduced repeaters. Now, the neat thing that they really wanted to do with Fusion is, you get over the air, it's 9600 BPS, which is double what D-Star is. So it's a little bit wider signal, not significantly wider, but a little bit wider. <coughs> And you have different modes. You can allocate all of that bandwidth to voice, and you get better voice quality. You can divide it in half and leave part of it for voice and part of it for data. And your voice quality goes down a little bit, but you get uh, 4,800 BPS on data. Or you can go full data and get 9600 BPS. So they offered three of those modes uh, that any of the fusion radios from Yezu will actually do. As I said, all the radios and the repeaters, even the repeater, can operate in FM or digital. Now, uh, Yezu was. Well, I'll, I'll wait to say that. Um, several of the functions which were initially introduced for Fusion is group monitor. This is similar to um, APRS or DPRS. Um, it's, it's a little, I'll say it's a little more cumbersome because you have to define who you want to monitor. And if somebody falls within communications range, and that's not really well defined whether that's through a repeater or just direct, uh, it will display the distance and direction to them. And you can do short messages and you can do images through that group monitor function. Yezu introduced an accessory for the handheld which has a camera. Now, you point the end of the microphone and take your picture. I don't know what, I, what picture I took until I send it. So that was a little bit cumbersome in its implementation. Smart navigation, that's really, you're able to, a lot of radios will do this, uh, even non-digital radios that have GPS in them. Display your own position, uh, current position of others, track to a location or backtrack routes. Those are some major functions. Now, there, Yezu came out with some very nice features in both their handheld and their mobile. Number one, the mobiles have a very nice, good size, color touch screen display. Ooh, ah, it is nice, I'll tell you that. So here are some examples of what uh, can be displayed on it. All of the radios are dual band, they are dual receive, similar in a Yezu line to like a VX7, VX8, um, and they can do either analog or uh, digital. Built-in GPS, good function. You can't do the nearest repeater at this point, but I would look to see that in a future firmware update. Like D-Star, transmit your call sign in digital. You also have built-in APRS, which is a nice feature to have in the radio. And it's done in analog, regular APRS, and then you have a lot of capabilities to display received APRS stations. Very nice function. The, the thing that, 
The thing you have to remember with fusion, it's early. Um, when you really think about it, it's just a couple of years old in starting to deliver radios and functionality. So I wouldn't call it beta, but you're going to see a lot more if it continues to grow, and I think it will, uh, and more capabilities. There's already been firmware updates for the mobile, the handheld, and the repeaters, so you will see new features coming through. One of the things that is a shortcoming at this point in time, remember I talked about you have data capability along with your voice, you can't really get to it right now, other than that microphone camera. So there is a port on there that kind of looks like a USB, but it's not really a standard USB connector. Um, remember Yezu introduced that first four pin mic plug and it took a while before other people did that. Uh, this is another one of those kind of proprietary connector things. But once you get direct access to the data stream, then you'll see a lot more development. Again, I think a coming attraction. The repeater was introduced November of 2013. Well, I, let me take that back. They started taking orders for a beta program. And the beta program, they were going to do, I think there was a number, and I want to say 500, in their beta program and put out, it, you could apply for it, and if you did that, they gave you a repeater, they gave you one of the FTM 400 mobiles, and they gave you um, one handheld, the FT1. And so you could then, you were required to give them feedback on features and things like that. So it was kind of a beta program, but it got a, a lot of interest. And a lot of clubs and individuals started uh, applying for that. <laughs> The repeater is, and, and one of the things that Yezu touted as an advantage to System Fusion was, it will operate, the repeater will operate either FM or digital. So it can go in and replace your current FM repeater and people can still use it without having to buy a digital radio. And if somebody has a digital radio, it will switch modes and transmit digital. You actually have three configurations in the modes. One is it can be FM only. FM goes in, FM goes out, just like a regular repeater. One, you can have either digital or FM in, and it's always FM out, so everybody can still hear it. And then the other one is digital in, digital out, digital only. They advertise it as being 50 watt capable. What's actually inside the box, just like on the ICOM repeaters, are two modified mobiles. <laughs> you can't run 50 watts in repeater continuous duty service. So some people found out the hard way when they burned up their finals uh, that you really only need to run it at about 25 watts. Uh, ICOM only allows you to do that with their repeaters, so I guess they kind of figured that out early on. The promotional program ended for the betas and they started a program that you could buy the commercial version, which then became the DR1X. The DR1X, they said, you can buy this for $500. I don't know anywhere you can buy a repeater, brand new, in the box, for $500. They, I, I actually got Chris Wilson, who's the uh, uh, Yezu representative, nationally, national sales manager, I emailed him yesterday and said, can you tell me how many repeaters you've shipped? He said, I can't tell you exactly, but let's say over 1,500. A lot of people are buying these repeaters. Here's the unfortunate thing. Most of them replace their old FM repeater and are operating in FM only mode. I would say less than 10% have actually had a digital signal go through them. Will that change? Probably so. As you get more radios out there 
and more people using the digital mode, they're bound to be more. And you can transition, and that, that was a really promotion, promotional point that Yezu had. We, uh, we, put, uh, we actually bought a couple of them in GARS to replace a couple of the repeaters, uh, some older equipment. The first night we were going to introduce people to that repeater, um, we were going to move everybody off the net over to the new Fusion repeater. Now this would have been an FM mode. We had one problem. There was a digital QSO going on in the process. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a digital radio. I went over and said, guys, can you stand by a little bit? We're going to move a net over here. So while it can be an advantage to be able to do FM or digital, it also has its disadvantages, and you need to very carefully consider um, how you want to operate it. Now, obviously, they have been very successful. Um, we bought two repeaters ourselves uh, to replace uh, a couple that are in place. So a lot of people are buying these. I cannot tell you, even as a uh, coordinator right now in Georgia, how many we have around the state. You could be talking on one and not know it because you're in FM mode. Um, in coordinating these, frequency coordinating them, because it will operate in mixed mode, both wideband FM and narrowband digital, you don't get the advantages of being to, to be able to be coordinated on a narrowband digital channel. You have to be coordinated on a regular 25 kilohertz spacing FM channel because it is, uh, can operate in wide mode because it would splatter on those other narrowband channels that are, are set aside. <coughs> so um, the repeater is not, it, it also has the same touch screen color display. So in terms of programming the repeater, and it is dual, dual band, so if you want it to be a UHF repeater, program in the input and the output. If you want it two meters, program those frequencies in. Um, it has built-in PL or DCS, a lot of very nice features. However, at this point in time, you cannot link it digitally to another repeater. It does have a 12-pin, I think it is, accessory jack on the back, which brings out all the analog signals, so a lot of people are hooking them to their other repeater controllers at this point in time. They do have plans, Yezu does have great plans to do linking. Um, they already had the linking technology called wires. Um, it's not very popular in the US, some people use it. It seems to be more popular in Japan. But they're going to introduce, in fact they already have introduced, um, a new version of the wires they call Wires X and you can buy this little HRI 200 box for about $125 I believe. However, you cannot link digitally repeaters together at this point in time. They're saying that it's going to require firmware upgrade which they're working on. Uh, latest word is going to be early 2016 when that firmware upgrade will come out. Um, it's not exactly known how that will interface, but you can get on right now and, and it uses a different concept. Um, to It connects like to a mobile, kind of like an Echolink node that's not at a repeater. And so you can get on that way and, and conference into rooms is the way it's set up. Um, anxious to see how this is going to pan out. Again, if you're the new guy, it takes a little while to do this. This is John Davis's opinion, uh, not an official position for anyone. I think what I comment, what Yezu is suffering through right now is the same thing ICOM suffered through early on. Right now you have the bus being driven by your Japanese corporate office. They think they know a lot about the U.S. market and how we do things. <laughs> they really don't. ICOM was able to avoid some of that, much of that actually, by people developing 
third-party software and hardware early on and kind of took it out of Japan's hands. Right now, I am guessing that's the situation for Yezu. There are people working on some of those third-party applications and hardware right now. I know specifically of some that are. So I would think that you're going to see more capabilities developing into this not too distant future. But that's, uh, that's where we are with the two right now. Um, I will say this on the quality of the repeaters, and this really applies to both ICOM and Yezu. Their repeaters are not what I call the, the Motorola grade repeaters. <coughs> Pardon? Not commercial. not commercial grade. They're mobiles. What happens when you drive through the connector downtown with a mobile rig? If you don't have tone squelch on, you're probably going to hear some garbage, right? Well, keep in mind the basis of these repeaters are modified mobiles that have been put in here with a, a controller and some other software and a power supply to become a repeater. Where I will say ICOM might have a slight advantage, the filters have been changed to be strictly narrowband, six and a quarter kilohertz. Um, it's still not a high quality commercial grade repeater, but it will be a little bit less susceptible to some of the noise, adjacent noise. Uh, this by being both wideband FM and um, digital, uh, it's going to have wideband filters in it. So it's yet to be seen in a uh, uh, really high RF environment, how it will perform. But you're going to see a bunch of these. I mean, there's already a bunch of them out there. I know there's already dozens in operation in Georgia, but most of them are in FM mode at this point in time. Uh, I hope they do well with it. Uh, I'd like to see more capabilities built in. And if you're the, the next guy in, you can always leapfrog the other guy. It's easier to, to best him on uh, what you come up with next. So it's going to be fun to watch. In the meantime, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of toys to play with in the digital arena. Here's just kind of a quick rundown. This is my last slide uh, before the next two-hour segment. <laughs> so if you kind of compare these, just kidding, Bob would shoot me. <laughs> Number of digital users, I can't really estimate in System Fusion because there's a lot of people going through the repeaters right now, but I, I can't really estimate how many. There's got to be in the neighborhood of thousands that are capable out there because they've sold thousands of radios. Uh, I do know because of the registration process, there's greater than 42,000 digital users on DSTAR. In the U.S.? Uh, worldwide. Uh, over half of those are U.S. The repeaters, um, that's the latest numbers that I can come up with. Uh, bandwidth, as you'll see, D-Star is slightly uh, more spectrally efficient, uh, both uh, significantly less than FM. Um, because Fusion, as I said, wearing my coordinator hat, uh, because it will operate both FM, mixed mode, with digital, you don't have access to some of the channels that are, or pairs, that are specifically designated for narrowband digital. Linking, uh, pretty mature in D-Star, uh, coming uh, in System Fusion. Uh, both of these will allow the user to determine where your signal goes. So any linking that you'll do, that will be done in either of these uh, technologies by the user from their radio. And that's another thing because they are specifically designed for amateur radio. Uh, data, uh, Fusion will have an advantage in higher speed data once you have access to the data port, something coming. Uh, both of them, there's software available, you can program it from the front panel. Uh, user devices, right now D-Star has a significant edge with a lot of different toys. Uh, homebrew, uh, a lot of different third-party products that are available. You will see those in System Fusion soon. Uh, that's really it. Might have time for a question or two and back to... 
Back to sleep. Norm. You, you said when you started that you thought fusion would grow rather quickly, uh, but you didn't really say why. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I think, um, well, there, there were some people who bought the uh, Yeezy radios early on, as soon as they were introduced. You know, we all have our favorites. Some people like Icom, some people like Yezu, some people like Kenwood. And so you've got people that said, I don't like Icom, and they bought Yezu radios. And they are very nice radios, I will tell you that. Um, they, each one of the modes has advantages and disadvantages with that. I think it's slowed down a little bit, and one of the main reasons is that with Yezu being delayed on having the full repeater linking functionality, it has slowed down their growth. Five years from now, we may say, well, that was just a blip on the, on the timeline. Uh, but right now, you're still seeing both of them grow. One's more established. You know, I don't know if this is going to be a VHS beta war <laughs> downstream, but right now, people are joining either camp. Any other questions? Do you foresee a Rosetta Stone between Fusion and D-Star? Actually, um, that is a of the digital technologies that are out there, um, these two offer the best route to have some, not compatibility, but a way to bridge them. And one of the ways that I know is kind of under development is at the reflector stage. So if you had reflectors that fusion repeaters could connect to, and you have D-star repeaters that connect to, the transition is actually made at that level. So that way, it, it, you might be able to bridge that. Is that there today? No. Is that being envisioned? Yeah, it is. Neil? I'm not a Kenwood fan, but I'm just curious whether Kenwood is thinking about entering this fray. Um, officially, Phil won't say. Uh, Phil Parker. Well, there have been rumors that um, commercially, both ICOM and Kenwood collaborated on a digital standard uh, for commercial called NXDN. Uh, they offer that as an alternative to P25 or DMR. Rumor that I have heard. I could be 100% wrong, is that Kenwood is thinking about offering a digital, well, actually a tri-mode radio, FM, NXDN, which there's some of that in amateur radio as well, not much, and a certain digital standard. I don't know. Whoever charges them the least. I got my ear to the ground, but that's all I know, Neil. Yeah. Yes. Since D Star is open, would you expect some of the low end manufacturers to start like profiling you know, the Chinese guys to Um I would think well I back after D Star kind of took hold, call this around the 2010, 2011 time frame, I have no idea why a Lenco didn't jump on the bandwagon. To me, you had ICOM do the R&D to prove there's a market there, and then they could come in and be, for those of you who are old enough to remember calculators coming in in the 70s, they could be what TI was to HP and come in with a lower price radio. Um, I would love to see them do that. They don't have any interest. So now we have the Chinese radios. Um, one thing I've heard on the Chinese radios, um, they're made, like I don't know, I, I don't claim to know how to pronounce it either, Wuxon or Baofeng. I know that's a real bruising of, of what they're really called. 
are made in the same factory as some of the Yezu radios. <laughs> we all know about proprietary information in China. So um, it would not surprise me that, that uh, one of these Chinese radios actually enters that market. Uh, I know there already there's already a Chinese manufacturer making a real inexpensive DMR radio. I bought one of those. Uh, there's a company here in the U.S. that sells that Connect Systems. So instead of buying a five or six hundred dollar Motorola DMR handheld, uh, I bought a hundred and eighty dollar handheld from them. So that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yes. Um, the book coder chip is that licensed? It is. It, yeah, here's where people go, aha, there is something proprietary in there. Um, all of the, including commercial manufacturers, use a chip family from VL, VLSI, I think it is. Um, it started with the AMBE chip. Um, P25 first started with the IMBE, and then they switched over. And now there's even a later version, the AMBE 3000, that's out there, which they just keep adding a lot of capabilities to it. That is a proprietary patented voice coder. That is the only thing that is really proprietary in the radio. But, you know, we might say, well, we're hams. Couldn't we do our own software vocoder? Well, if you don't have it in silicon, then you're depending on your processor in the radio to do a lot more of the coding and decoding, the conversion. So it's been simpler for most people, most of the manufacturers, to buy a $20 chip instead of reinventing the wheel. Yes, right behind so, you. So uh, when Ogre Fork comes online, if I link my uh, radio to through the Ogre Fork repeater to a Dallas repeater, does that mean the Ogre Fork repeater is blocked out from anybody else here? Uh, basically, yes. I mean, you're still going, anyone could come into the Ogle Thorpe repeater, and anybody could come into the Dallas repeater, but they would be linked together. So when you do that, you're really linking them to computer. Right, computer right. Um, on D-Star, that's one of the reasons in a lot of the places around Georgia that we installed them, um, we put both a VHF and a UHF. So that way, if you, know, you wanted to link, and one of the things we did in Georgia with the grant, we got a uh, enterprise class server, which is Reflector 30. For those of you who do D-Star, uh, Reflector 30 is one of, the, one of the two busiest reflectors in the world. And it's here in Atlanta in a commercial data center in Norcross. Reflector 30C, which is just one of the different uh, conference modules in there, uh, is about the busiest. 30B has all the Georgia repeaters connected together for like emergency communications, Skywarn, that type of thing. You can unlink them and link them somewhere else at any time you want. And then when you get off, after a period of idle time, it'll unlink and go back to where it's default. Yes. 